Why must the Redeemer be truly God? That because of his divine nature, his obedience and suffering would be perfect and effective. And also that he would be able to bear the righteous anger of God against sin and yet overcome death. There have been many victims, many innocent ones who have been slain by oppressors. Even on that Friday, there were three crucified. Many have been tortured. Many have been killed. But something unique went on in the middle of that hill that day. Something absolutely extraordinary occurred on that Good Friday. A truly innocent human being was slaughtered. Not only that, a truly innocent human being descended into the very pit of hell, exclaiming, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Unlike the two thieves, this one did not deserve execution. Unlike the countless victims of political oppression throughout the centuries, this one's fate has led to a revolution, to an overturning of the way things have been done and an undoing of the status quo. The world will never be the same since the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why must this one be God? Why must our Savior, our Redeemer, be divine? In the first chapter of the Gospel according to John, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We read that this Word was the one who created all things. We read that this Word came down and illumined the world, but the world did not receive him. We read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. That is the promise of the gospel, that this Jesus of Nazareth, to be identified in the very first story, the story of his appearance to his cousin, John the Baptizer, out at the Jordan River, that this Jesus brings the eternal, divine, glorious presence of God into our very midst. John signals this by using the verb dwelt, or more literally, tabernacled. This word become flesh tabernacled amongst us, pointing back to those many occasions in the Old Testament where God's very presence would be amidst his people in the form of the tabernacle glory, closed off, guarded, protected, but nonetheless right there amidst God's people, guiding, preserving, strengthening, giving life. Jesus is that one. Jesus is the fulfillment of that tabernacle promise. He is God incarnate. He is the Word, the Creator, the Light, the Giver of life become incarnate. We read later in that first story that's reported in this very first chapter of John's Gospel that when Jesus approaches John the baptizer, John exclaims that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It must be a Lamb from God who could do something like that. Humans have been bringing their lambs for centuries. But we know, as Hebrews tells us, that the blood of bulls and goats simply won't do. That we need a Savior come down from heaven. We need a Redeemer from God's own side. We need one who can effectively serve as a sacrifice, who can once and for all do away with sin and its every deleterious effect. We need one who can swallow down the curse to the full, who can endure the full cup of God's wrath on our behalf. And this means that we need not simply a human being, but a human being who is also divine who is not encumbered himself by the limits of finitude or fallenness, but who can be eternally effective, one who can actually deliver in bringing innocence and blamelessness and still further divine pleasure and fatherly acceptance to many. 
And this is what we read is true in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in Christ, God is bringing many sons to glory. Now, a human being might, were he perfect, stand in and suffer on behalf of one other, but to bring many sons to glory. This requires more than simply a human being. It requires a human being who is also divine. And so it is fit, it is appropriate, it is needful, dare we say, that the Redeemer not only be human, but also be divine. This is precisely what Athanasius and the Cappadocian fathers insisted on so ardently in the fourth century as they opposed a number of heretics who argued that perhaps Jesus was an inspired human being. Perhaps Jesus was uh, an exceptionally religious, moral, and fastidiously obedient human being. Perhaps he was anointed from on high, but nonetheless, he was a mere human. Against this, the fathers of the early church insisted that for his grace and his gospel to be affected, Jesus must be not only a human being, authentically and perfectly so, but also the divine Son. He must bring the resources of heaven to bear on his earthly work and even upon his journey through the valley of sin and death, his very descent into the dregs of hell. And so that journey of the Son of God into the far country truly is effective once and for all in bringing many sons to glory precisely because this is not simply another guy another human being, another sufferer, another one who enters the abject horrors of this world and in seeking to serve others finds his undoing. No, this one is effective. This one decisively changes the course of human history because this one comes from outside human history. This one, though he was in the form of God, was willing to humble himself. And though he would eventually be exalted on high and bowed and confessed as Lord to the glory of God the Father, was willing to be jeered and scorned and blasphemed and executed on our behalf. Precisely because this one is the Lord of glory, this one's suffering and humiliation is so decisive, so effective, so saving. Why was it necessary for the Redeemer to be truly God? So that he might bring what is only God's, life, peace, and fullness to those who are anything but. And in Jesus Christ, we have this hope assured that he has become what we are, that we might become what he is.